can't imagine um, the kind of pressure that one is under when each speaker says something really funny before they start. So I thought I'd just tell you now that I've got nothing funny to say. <laughs> in, 2000, uh, in February 2050, I'll either be celebrating my 76th birthday or I'll be buried under a mango tree, my ashes washed around by rain, mingling with the earth, absorbed into the roots. And if my grandchildren are anything like my kids, I imagine them debating if eating the mangoes from this tree would make them cannibals. <laughs> 2050 seems such a long way off in the life of one individual, but it's not in the life of a continent whose future is increasingly bound to the rest of the world and questions abound about whether it will be recognized for its innovation, productivity, and development, or whether it will be left behind. Where one hopes for the former, it's really very hard to predict. And of course, I'm talking about Africa. Just a few days ago, I drove through the gates of my house in Lagos. A rather perplexed nanny told me that there was no electricity, that the inverter had run out, and that we couldn't power our generator because there was a fuel scarcity. For a few seconds, I thought, this is 2000, this is 2015. How is it that a country where oil was discovered about 60 years ago is yet to sort out its power generation? But that's Nigeria, a country that also turned a corner a few weeks ago by voting out a failed or failing incumbent, a rare occurrence on our continent. And it's these contradictions that make this exercise uniquely complex. So I decided to start by making two lists that reflect some of the current realities and to ask myself what the current trends are and what they tell us about what 2050 will look like. So I started with 10 positives. One, for the most part, the weather is glorious. <laughs> Two, democracy is becoming more widespread. Three, more people have access to education. Four, there are pockets of real measurable development. Five, people are becoming more wired. Six, there is more regional cooperation. Seven, we're living longer, albeit without electricity. Eight, new technology makes communication easy. Nine, Nigerians were deemed the happiest people on earth about six years ago. Uh, 10, more oil is being discovered. So I also made a list about some of the worrying negatives. One, more oil is being discovered. <laughs> Two, ethno-religious conflict abounds. Three, terrorism. Four, one non-African country seems to have won the contract to develop most of that continent. <laughs> Five, the gap between the rich and the poor is ever widening. Six, superstition plays too vital a role in daily life. Seven, the suppression of human rights, gay rights. Eight, there are still very few truly industrialized economies. Nine, when I'm trying to write and my mobile phone doesn't stop ringing, I wonder if um, technology actually makes communication too easy. And 10, um, the quality of leadership and how long some of our leaders insist on staying in power. <coughs> Mugabe. How the 
the tussle between these opposing forces plays out will determine the shape that Africa will be in over the next few decades. I wish I had a predict the future app that I could feed these lists into to help me um, get a really clear picture of 2050. But is there really any point? I'm a bit of a pessimist. How do we know that the entire world will not have gone up in flames before 2050? I mean, think about it. We have people who believe that it is their duty to destroy and to kill in the name of religion. And there are weapons that can achieve this on a grand scale and swiftly too. But let's say these two elements have not yet come together in a devastating way and that Africa is still here in 2050. Let's also say that I make it to 76. What would I see? What would I hear? What would I read about in my hilltop retirement retreat overlooking the forests that swaddle my hometown in Ogun State? Now, without a doubt, the women would have had to step in to stop the men turning Africa into a complete wasteland. <laughs> the men folk will have been engaged in wars, egged on by foreign powers who are eager to sell their arms and test out their weapons. But once women take charge across the continent, these wars will immediately die out. Our new leaders will have meaningful conversations and bonding sessions where they will discuss the works of Mariam Abba, Bessie Head, Audrey Lord. They'll talk about uh, shoes and lipstick and the Wonder Bra. <laughs> They'll talk about how to make uh, Nkrumah's vision of a Pan-African state a reality. <laughs> They'll talk about the fact that history is back in schools and being taught in a meaningful way. They'll talk about how some women are from both Mars and Venus, <laughs> and how Nigeria is leading Africa into a new era of sustainable, eco-friendly power generation. <laughs> Africa will be one big happy family cooperating in trade and leisure and advancing our economic interests in the global marketplace, ushering in an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Naturally, we uh, will have found ways for men to nurture pregnancies so parents can take turns. <laughs> men will finally know how women feel. Then one day, just as we're basking in the euphoria of having built the nations of our dreams for our children, we will look up into the sky and see a dark cloud. The sun will lose its shine and become gray like hardened shoe polish. The warmth on our skin will be replaced by an unearthly chill. We will listen to the newscaster panicking in our in-ear stereos, telling us that some country still being run by men has detonated the bomb. This will happen in the year 2051, and I did warn you that I was a pessimist. <laughs>